Hi, good morning, Kev. Happy solstice. How are you doing? Happy solstice to you as well, Sam. Good morning. Yes, I'm fan dabby dozy. <laughs> good, thank you. <laughs> um, if it's okay, Kev, can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, so I'm Kev Bailey. I'm going through a little bit of a death and rebirth at the moment. I was known as Connective Therapies, but I'm now becoming the Uncommon Heartfelt Touch. So I'm an holistic therapist and a healer um, based in Long Eaton, uh, which is Derbyshire, not far from East Midlands Airport. Um, and I'm loving my life. This is my calling. That's lovely. How long have you been doing it? Um, full time now, it would seem, looking at some of my memories on Facebook, since about 2015. Wow. And then I was doing it part time before then, probably for about five years previous. So from about 2010, I've been doing my holistic therapies. And then from about 2005 is when I suppose I really got into spirituality I woke up from being a muggle and how how did your awakening happen did it just come to you or did you just well, hear a voice one day it's quite a long story um but to cut it short my father and I we never had a really good relationship when I was a child um he was an ex-military policeman and I was a I'm an Aquarian rebel and so we clashed quite a lot. And then I was asked to leave home. Then I joined the army and then we repaired our relationship over a long period of time. And then when it had just got good, he decided to check out on me, which made me very angry. Um, I had been teaching martial arts and stuff previous as well. So I knew a little bit about meditation and things, but I was also running up pub and I was trying to keep the village idiots out and the powder and those brigade so all of that anger on top of my father's death and I knew that I had to do something about it and then a series of events unfolded, unfolded themselves and here I am because previous to that I didn't believe in any of this I thought yeah okay well I'll load a tosh prove it and then I started to see things and feel things on the meditation and it just went, wow, OK, there is a bit more to life than you think. And I've never looked back since. Wow, what a story. Mm. That is amazing. So knowing that you've come, you've come all the way through to the other side now, so to speak. Yeah. And you're fully awakened and you're working Ooh, for the I'm not sure if I'm fully awakened yet. I'm still awakening, I think. I don't think we, any of us, well, there probably are some people, but most of us don't fully awaken. There's always new knowledge to learn and stuff like that. So we may be awakened, but perhaps not fully awakened yet. That's I, don't really know, I don't think any of us know our true potential. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So what if you were to chat to one of your guys one of your regulars down the pub that you had now knowing what you know now and they were to tell you that oh it's just a load of old tosh what would you say to them <sighs> to be honest I wouldn't even try to convince them because they have to find it out for themselves and you can talk to somebody like that all day I mean if you'd have talked to me 20 30 years ago and I just looked at you had gone out you know you know you've obviously been smoking something or drinking something or you know, so uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that don't wake up or haven't woken up yet. And to try and to convince somebody about your beliefs, I kind of get the feeling that that's forcing them and they'll work, they'll wake up in their own good time. However, if you do want to have a bit of a conversation, then I'm open to a conversation whether they think I'm radio rental or not. Uh, but it sows seeds, and then maybe 5, 10, 15 years later, they might go, ah, that nutter in the pub, he said that. You know, who knows? It's a very strange world out there at the minute. <clears throat> it is. That's a really lovely perspective to put on things as well, because we're all on our own journey, aren't we? We're all on our yes. own paths and we're all at different 
stages yeah. of our journey as well yes. so it is always nice to plant those seeds though you know just in yeah. the hope that they will have that one epiphany moment you know well everybody thinks like everything at the moment is all about clearing your past so that you can move forward to your future mm. absolutely yeah i yes. love that mm. so i just want to just talk about the the masculine energies at the moment because i feel like they are just being repressed at the moment um and there's this great stigma around um males men um not stepping into spirituality or having some kind of fear of stepping into or exploring spirituality um it's seen as more of a woman dominated community um i think we are just more spiritual beings in that way in in some respects but i think i don't know there's this complete duality isn't there the divine masculine and the divine feminine and yes. i think it's time now that that the men kind of accepted who they are and started exploring themselves a little bit more and having the confidence to do that. Would you agree? I definitely would. And I must admit, when I first started out and I was perhaps doing mind, body, spirit fairs and things like that, and I was turning up, I would probably be the only bloke there. Um, over the years, though, there have been more and more gentlemen coming into it. Um, some of them, when I first started, they might have just been selling crystals and stuff like that with their wives and whatever. But now more and more blokes are getting into it. I do get the feeling as well that, yes, this is the time of the divine feminine and all the rest of it. And you guys, you have brilliant ideas and stuff like that. But you still, unfortunately, you still need us blokes because I think we're the ones that actually go out there and do it. And I'm not saying you ladies don't because you do it in a different way. You're the creative types and things like that. But every now and again, you need somebody to go out there and kick ass for you. And I think that's where the divine masculine comes in. I'm not saying that you're going to go and smack somebody or something like that, but it's about having the wherewithal and the courage and all the rest of it to go out there and, and do what needs to be done. So take the current situation. There's a lot of things going on at the moment. And I, I'm a really big advocate for um, power over force. So if you try and force something and you go out there and there's a war and there's all this going on and stuff, that's all force. But to stand in your power and do something like perhaps Gandhi, where he more or less single-handedly brought down the British government in India, but he didn't use any force whatsoever. He was just stood for in his power. And then he helped to create things that then went on. And even Nelson Mandela, I mean, he started out using force because he was in a terrorist organisation to start with. But then he realised that force wasn't working. So then he stood in his power and look what happened in South Africa. So, you know, it's not about win wars. Wars just create more anguish and hatred and stuff like that so this is what us blokes have got to get away from it's not the oh i'm bigger and harder than you or or the other thing is as well there's a lot of guys out there that to validate themselves have to go and get loads of notches on their bedposts and stuff like that it's not about that anymore it's about integrating our own feminine sides as it's the same with you guys integrating your masculine side so that we can become a more complete old person and then we can move forward into our full potential um but unfortunately there are still a lot of guys out there that because of programming because of peer pressure they don't want to admit that they're into this sort of thing and i used to get it when i was working at rolls royce that I was told, I got to talk to a couple of guys that were a bit more open 
And they said, well, don't go and tell the others because they'll just take the mickey out of your shift. And I said, well, that's fine because if they're taking the mickey out of me, they're leaving somebody else alone. But they would all gather around and we'd have a conversation and they would go, ah, what a load of rubbish and all the rest of it. And then a bit later on in the shift when they were caught me walking privately, they'd say, Kev, I've experienced this or I've got that or whatever. And I'm saying, well, oh, you didn't believe in this. It was all a load of tosh. So they do, but they don't want to admit it in front of their peers that there is stuff going on. So, yeah, so I've had some interesting conversations at Rolls-Royce with people. And I think maybe I was there in a way to help wake some of the people up there. There were others that you had no chance. So, mm. you know, it's pointless forcing them. But, yeah. So how, what do you think about the people that aren't willing to accept it, though? Do you think that's fear? Do you think there's just... Um... Just I think a lot of it's programming. I think some of it is fear and some of it they think that perhaps by recognising it, it demasculates them or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I also think like 2,000 years or more, blokes have been supposedly the warriors and the fighters and all of that sort of thing. And we're still trying to live up to that reputation when really we should let that reputation go because the only person that wins out of wars are the bankers, mm. um, you know, so, and it's not about money or it shouldn't be about money anymore. And hopefully that's what the new future is going to be. It's going to be more about um, realizing our full potential and that money is way down the list compared with health and spirituality and love and all the rest of it so yeah but um, it's going to take a little while and I, but i think there's a lot of people going to get woken up pretty shortly that money isn't everything because i think it's going to be taken away from a lot of people mm. and we're starting to see it happen at the moment so yeah we're in the early stages absolutely <laughs> do you have a, a prediction then uh, more of a specific prediction have you been chatting with your uh with your guides have they given you any wisdom nuggets of wisdom i don't think it's a prediction but i do think it's a knowing there are two timelines going on at the moment i believe one is the baddies timeline where they want to crash everything and um, to control us but there's also a goodies timeline but we're not hearing much about that at the moment uh, and, and also the goodies aren't going to reveal themselves because then they're over then to the baddies and they're going to be taken out or it's going to um, not be as easy for the goodies to win. But the goodies are winning and there are stuff going on, but the goodies also want to collapse the old systems because it's too corrupt. And once they've got all the corruption out of the way, then hopefully they can rebuild or we can rebuild because it will be a collective thing, a better world, and move forward. And But it might take hundreds and hundreds of years. It might take 10 or 20 years. I don't know, but I know it's coming. And it has been predicted by various people that this is what we're going through at the moment. And I think this is a death and rebirth of the whole world. You know, um, And you have to have all this chaos, because out of chaos comes order. Mm just that we can't see the order yet absolutely so it might not be in our lifetime but we've still got to we've got to still keep working yeah i, I, I get a feeling that it is going to be in our lifetime ah. however it may, might not be 100 percent good in our lifetime but it is it's starting now so it just depends on how long it's going to drag out but i don't think at the minute it's going to drag out for very much longer mm -hmm. maybe another year or two to get through the chaos and then the good stuff might start kicking in. That soon, really? I think so. We've, I think we're building up to a crescendo at the moment. That's really interesting. So we need to start preparing then. Or we yes. should have already started preparing. Well, we should have started because the chaos that's coming is going to catch an awful lot of people out because there are a lot of people out there that have kind of got their heads buried in the sand um, and no disrespect, but I'm coming across an awful lot of women that don't really want to know what's going on because they don't want their 
their life and that to be shattered. They don't want to start thinking about what may be coming and stuff like that. And then there are a lot of others that are still programming or programmed to um, be in the materialistic stuff and things like that. So, you know, it's changing. Slowly but surely it is changing. Yeah. So what could what could we do? Well, I do think that the chaos that's coming is about food shortages, utility shortages. I'm hearing, well, already at the moment, the stock markets are starting to crash. Crypto's coming down. Um, I get a feeling it's not happening quite yet, although I'm hearing little things about house prices are starting to drop, but I think there's a housing market crash coming as well, which will be perpetuated by rising interest rates, job losses, all of this sort of thing that unfortunately we're going to have to go through before we can come out the other side. But I mean, the housing market is, the 10-year bubble is well overdue. So, you know, but this is part of the plan on both sides. I, I believe that housing is well overpriced. It should never be like this. But governments have done that to make people feel that they're rich and wealthy and all the rest of it because house prices keep continuing to rise. But now it's getting to the point where people can't afford houses. And I've just heard yesterday, I was talking to a builder and he was saying that a lot of these new housing estates now, the ones, the houses that were coming up to completion, they're finishing, but the rest that they've started, they're leaving them. They're not carrying on at the moment because they know that they're not going to be able to sell them fairly shortly. Wow. That's terrible, Mm. really. So there's little signs that you see here and there that on their own probably don't mean much, but when you put it all together, you can see a bigger picture that's starting to emerge. Yeah. Mm. So in terms of... Um, thank you very much for that. It's really insightful. I think that's going to be um, food for thought for many. Yes. So, but in terms of let's bring it um, down to kind of ground level. Okay. Um, in terms of preparation, have you been preparing yourself already? I have been buying extra food and getting candles in. I've got camping gear. Um, not that I'm going to go and disappear out into the woods, but. I've got a gas cooker and things like that, because that's the other thing. You can't get all the color gas at the moment. It's it's mm. like a two, three week wait to get a bottle of color gas. It's amazing. So at that's least really interesting. You, you can cook and, and maybe the you might want to go, if you've got a log burner, you're laughing, but if not, go and buy a gas fire or whatever to keep warm, because I'm hearing that they are going to be lots of power cuts and stuff like that coming. So yeah, I've got a fridge full of food and a freezer full of food but if I get a power cut I'm stuffed anyway so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got to eat it all by the time it defrosts <laughs> yeah so I'm going to be bigger than I am now yeah <laughs> um okay so I just want to bring things um back to you um and about what you do because don't you do kinesiology and the back flowers as well can you tell us a little bit about that so kinesiology is works on Chinese medical principles and meridian lines and energy blockages, but it's a bit more it's it's a bit more scientific. Well, not scientific is the wrong word, but it's a bit more physical than acupuncture and stuff because we use muscle testing to find out what meridian lines are blocked. So there are a basic seventeen muscle tests. There are more. Um, each muscle test works on a meridian line and depending on the results of whether the muscle is strong or weak it tells us whether there's a blockage or something going on in that meridian line so we would do the 17 tests and then we analyze the results and then a little bit of guesswork and also a bit of knowledge and then also confirming it because you can ask the body questions and the body will tell us through a muscle test whether we're yes or no. And the body tells us what it wants to fix and in what order it wants to fix it. 
and then we will fix it using lymphatic massage and drainage, running meridian lines, holding neurovascular points. And then at the end, we go back and we check the muscle test again to see whether it's gone strong. And if it has gone strong, then we know we've sorted it. If it hasn't, then we would need to do it again or look at something else that may be causing it. But if you know the tests and the fixes with kinesiology, I think you can fix just about anything and everything. Wow. However, it also depends on the client, whether they want to be fixed. And believe me, some clients don't. They have a vested interest in being ill, whether they consciously know it or subconsciously. Either it's about getting money because they're claiming universal credits or something, or it gets some attention, or it's the body is telling them that they need to look at themselves because they're creating their illness because they're ignoring what it is that they need to go and do or what the lesson is that they need to learn. So, yeah, and so out of sheer ignorance, because they don't realise that that's what's going on, they create these illnesses and blockages, stuff like that, and even beliefs where you've been programmed to believe certain stuff that can create blockages as well. So, hmm. But I don't just use kinesiology. So I introduce energy therapy, shamanic healing. So I take people on journeys. I pull energies out of people that are negative and stuff like that, replace it with positivity. If I need to amplify energies, I would use crystals and stuff. I have a crystal um, grid under my bed at home. I can't always do it when I'm traveling because I like to travel and meet go to new places and meet new people. So I've got a bit of a circuit of venues going on at the moment. So, yeah. So I don't think I can totally say what it is I do. I know the results I get, but sometimes how I'm getting those results is a bit beyond me. So, for instance, that I, I had a lady come to me who I didn't know was suffering from the effects of shedding and she was having issues down below and, and bleeding quite a bit and she came for a session and it was just um, a, like an energy session rather than going into any deep emotional stuff but apparently I stopped the bleeding and the reason I know is because of that she recommended her partner come and sort of see me and then when he arrived he told me the reason he'd come was because I'd reversed the effects of the shedding on his girlfriend. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known anything about it. So, and then I've had some people that are saying that their sense of smell and that has gone and taste, and I've managed to reverse that as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, so thanks for that. Let's um, just step back a little bit when you were telling us about um, what you're doing about the kinesiology and you were talking about meridian lines. Yes. What, what do you mean by meridian lines? So there are lines in our body that the Chinese have, on the Far East have discovered <clears throat> where the, there are channels of energy running through the body and they are related to certain muscles but they're also related to certain organs and so you have a heart meridian a liver meridian and so on Ooh, special guest <laughs> <laughs> this is bilbo uh, sorry hi bilbo <laughs> and, and so <clears throat> they can get blocked or broken sometimes if you have an operation or something like that they can slice through meridian lines and then, then interrupt the flow of the energy so it's all about getting the energy back flowing again. But also organs. So say, for instance, your liver's not working properly. It will start nicking energy from your lungs or your gallbladder or wherever, your spleen, which then has to start nicking energy from another organ and it becomes a vicious circle. So it's all about restoring the energy balance so that, the organs in your body are not getting depleted. Right. So, and then there are other things like the body clock in Chinese medicine where you eat certain foods at certain times because that's the optimum time for the organs to be working. Mm -hmm. So, and, and mostly like in the evening when you're resting, 
there aren't many or the, the organs that are working are the ones that are getting rid of toxins and stuff like that your digestion has stopped working because there's no food to eat things like that so that was why when I was working at Rolls Royce and it was shift work, I tried not to eat at night because your body's not used to you eating at night and having then because it shut down your digestive system to start doing other things. And then all of a sudden you eat and your body gets confused. And again, that's another reason why I think shift work creates illness. Because also as well, you're, you're throwing out your... Um, Rhythms where you know you, you should be sleeping, but you're not. You're working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are lots of people that are on shift work, and then when they finish, they die of heart attacks and things like that. Unfortunately, mm. some of them die before they actually leave. So, gosh, that's awful. Yeah, because we've we've got our natural cycles, just like the yes. Earth has got her natural cycle as well. Yeah. Um, which is. For the moon as well and i know that many women's cycles should go with the moon as well but yes. because of all the toxins and the food and everything nowadays as well it's throwing a lot of women out of that cycle some women aren't even in that cycle altogether yeah, because, even stress yeah. and emotional stuff that's going on throws out hormones and that as well <clears throat> according to dr bruce lipton it once you're once you go into fight and flight Everything, any non-essential systems all shut down. So your autoimmune system and so on and so on, your digestive system, all the blood goes to your arms and legs normally because you need it to run or fight or whatever. But it's only ever supposed to be temporary. But if you're in a long-term situation or your system gets overloaded and you get stuck in it, you need somebody, hopefully, to take you out of fight and flight so then your systems can reset because otherwise then long term that's when you start to get fiber and remy or any of these other labels that they want to put on the same condition because i believe it is the same condition it's just your immune systems shut down and then all these bugs and stuff that are in your body that have been kept in check think oh party and away they go and they start messing up your body so yes yeah, I just want to talk about uh, rheumatoid arthritis because I know that's a really big one uh, for when it comes to fight or flight because the, it's just the body attacking itself, isn't it? Yes. Well, I don't think the body attacks itself, but I think it gets the wrong message. Mm. And therefore the brain says, all right, I've got to do this. And it sends your RNA to go and do it. But when it gets there, it's obviously got the wrong message. So it's not fixing the situation. And it was quite funny, there's a lady in, in Birmingham called Heather Davy. She was, we were at a show together once and she just walked past me and says, you change RNA, you do. And I didn't even know what RNA was at the time. I had to go and look it up. And apparently I think it's what I do is, with the help of upstairs, is I change the message. So when it gets to where it is, if it's got a garbled or an incorrect message, it gets there with the right message and then does the correct job. So... Wow. So I've been told I can change RNA, I can knit bone and clean blood. Wow. I don't know whether I can or not. That's However, powerful. sometimes the results I get, this is medium friends have been telling me things like this and other healers, because I've, I've worked on other healers, and then when they give you the feedback, you think, really? Have I actually done that? You know, because it's amazing but what they tell you. But you don't, some, I, well, I personally don't realise that I'm doing that. I'm messing with people's sacred geometry and changing this, and changing that. And I'm apparently in some other lady says, I was running around the halls of Akashic Records, pulling all their files, changing them and putting them back again. Wow. And I go, well, no wonder I'm knackered at the end of the day then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where... That I'm doing this but apparently I am that's so, incredible so you're like um, a vessel you're a, a messenger or a um, jack of all you're trades take, yeah. You're take, yeah you're taking the power from upstairs and yes. channeling it through yeah whether you want to call it upstairs or the ether because it's all around us anyway and there's lots of dimensions around us that we can't see um, I mean if you go to a medium like my mother passed away last year she was in a lot of pain and agony and all the rest of it. 
but she was still quite compass men. It's quite funny because I went to see her and I used to say to her, do you want a healing then, mother? Yeah, you think you're Jesus, you are, but you ain't, you know, you can't <laughs> do it. Oh, all right, so you don't want a healing then, mother. Yeah, go on, I'll have one anyway. So you know, I used to zap her. And then the last time I went, her hands are really, really bad with arthritis. So I got a couple of carnelian crystals out and got her to hold her hands on top of mine with the crystals. And then it's going for about five minutes or so, and then it stopped. And I said, that's it, mother, it's all cut off now. And she nicked the crystals and she wouldn't give them back. So she knew that there was something going on. And I've had a couple of messages off her through mediums since. And she's come back and she says, well, if I knew how good it was over there, she'd have gone sooner. And I'm laughing now because my dad's peace and quiet's been shattered because his mother's back and she'll be nagging him. Uh, um, but she said, you don't know the Arthur what you can do. And then there's another lady I had a session with and she said, it's like I'm healing with two fingers and I've got 10. But apparently all of this is kicking in soon. And I had a session with a lady called Stacy Keese, who's a shamanic healer, because I've been having problems in the left leg. And it's been somebody kind of psychic attacking me. And there's a bit of emotional stuff that I need to look at as well about moving forward. <clears throat> so she cleared that, but then she said to me, you've got a lot of ancient scrolls, ancient knowledge scrolls, waiting at the bottom of my spine, and that I've got to integrate them and bring them in. And there was another lady, Tina Slade, in West Sussex. She said that all my healing and stuff was going to change, and that it was going to get accelerated things. So I'm hoping that this is what she was on about and what Stacey's on about and I've now integrated it and we'll wait and see what happens. That's so okay. exciting. Yes. But if you said this to somebody down the pub, they look at you and go, yeah, right. Oh, what drugs are you on? You know? <laughs> so, and sometimes I think, really? But you have to believe, you have to have that faith. And if I didn't have that faith, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Because this isn't a job for me. This is my calling. I gave up all my old muggle life to do this. The wife, the decent job at Rolls-Royce, my house. Because I knew I had to go and do this. I don't know how I knew, but I knew I had to go and do this. And so I'm doing it. And now my life is devoted to universal energies and hopefully working the good that's amazing you're literally in service of of helping people that's yes beautiful. i'm hoping that i've learned to come from a place of unconditional love and service to others mm. yes i'll still be paying for it because i've got to live as well but <clears throat> the money isn't the main reason it's the service side of it that is and it's the driving factor for me and the fact that i've been given this gift and that if I can turn so help somebody turn their life around, you know, because I don't actually heal them. All I do is create the catalyst and the, sow the seeds. They heal themselves, but they may not realise what it is, the manure or the fertiliser or whatever they had to put on the seed to get it to grow. Mm. So hopefully that's what I reveal to them and what their blockages are and what their beliefs are and, all the crap they've been holding on to so they can release it so you know yeah i i would definitely so i came for a session with you two three weeks ago yes. as well and and it was exactly that you know i think you were so unbelievably specific with uh what negative energies how i was holding on to in my body for starters yeah. i think when you'd released all that um it was quite um because it's not something that I'd experienced in ever ever yes. before um it took me probably a day or two to kind of process yep. what I'd been through um because it was uh recalling like traumatic um memories then yep. to be able to like you say get rid of the negative from that and replace it with the positive and your inner yes. power um and that was pure I was just such an incredible feeling afterwards and I lit I felt like I had such a, a ton of weight on my shoulders that I didn't even know was there 
I had no idea that I was carrying this baggage around with me and it felt so heavy until you lifted it, you know, until you allowed me to face what was um, in the back of my mind, being brought to the front of my mind and be like, look, this is your time. You've got to deal with this now. Um, Otherwise, you're just going to keep replaying it in your mind over and over again, which I think um is definitely something that a lot of people are dealing with right now and again they don't realize they're dealing with it's these repeated thoughts intrusive thoughts repeated patterns repeated destructive behavioral patterns also um because a lot of mine now have disappeared I couldn't get out of bed in the morning I could get out of bed in the morning but I hated it Mm. now with a combination of your healing therapy with your therapies um and a couple of others I'm waking up at five o'clock in the morning I can't really I can't wait to start the day you know it's it's Mm. just tremendous my diet has completely changed because I don't want to eat bad food I'm just it's it's almost like the programming has gone yes you know and I'm favoring healthier foods I prefer to taste organic foods because the taste is so much richer you yeah. know, um, and I have no desire for um, foods that I know are going to hinder my energy levels, that are going to hinder my um, brain function, because I feel like I'm firing on most cylinders now. Yeah. Probably not all cylinders, but most. And like uh, 80% of that is down to what you've cleared. Um, and also for the fact, because I, I had such an issue with my throat for years and years and I think you took two attempts at clearing clearing whatever yeah. energy was holding my throat back and that was you know it was like you know you want to say something but you can't get it out there's something going on here and and after that it just felt like any infection I had in my throat was gone which was just incredible and I I've felt like I can speak freely now and without fear you know mm. it's just incredible I think you know what you did um but on top of all the the therapies and and the techniques that you you took me through and you take others through the fact that you're so incredibly caring and genuine and interested in others like you have this genuine love for people um and an interest in helping people and you know you just come across as so loving and nurturing um and I think that has a tremendous that has so much to um to do with the whole session as a as a whole you know because you can't you can't nobody can say oh this is what I do x y and z and then be completely clinic clinical if you yeah. like you know I'm, what I'm trying to say I think is that you deliver the whole package you know I think you have to come from a place of love to be a better channel for the energies where if you're just clinical or maybe doing it for the money I don't want to judge but maybe you might not be quite as good a channel as you could be if you came from a place of love and it's quite funny because one of my power animals is a female brown bear which according to Native American tradition is the strongest healing energy and my nickname's bear but quite a few of my friends have started to call me the Care Bear. <laughs> so I'm going to get the T-shirt with a big pink heart on the front, <laughs> which should get me a few looks when I go down the pub, but there you go. <laughs> that is so lovely. But it's so true. You do have this wonderful, caring Care Bear energy. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank You're very you. welcome. <laughs> mm. um, so you were talking earlier about that you're all over the place that you love visiting new places and meeting new people so what's what's on your agenda whereabouts where do you visit well at the moment i've got three venues in leicestershire um one at thermiston at a place called yatahees um eternal being in enderby and then the health workshop in ashby i've also started to return one thursday a week on Thursday a week, there is only one Thursday in a week, but <laughs> every Thursday to the Birmingham Holistic Health Centre. 
Um, I also work from home in Long Eaton, but I'm hoping soon that I'm going to get a venue at South Street Spiritualist Church in Sheffield. And I'm working on, because I used to do quite a lot in Manchester and I have quite a huge client base up there, but because of all that's gone on and stuff like that, unfortunately fell by the wayside, but I'm doing a show in Manchester soon, which I'm hoping will open up the doorways for me to start going back up to Manchester again in the north. But I will go anywhere. I mean, I when I was still with my ex-wife and we were still living in the same house after we decided to split, she was bringing all her relations, the outlaws, if you like, over from Northern Ireland to come and stay for the week. And I thought I didn't really want to be there. So I put it out to the universe. I went on Facebook and said, look, if you can put me up for a night and feed me, I'll give you a healing session. So I went from Chesterfield to Bournemouth to Dorchester to Glastonbury to Ellesmere, meeting all these people and doing a session on them in exchange. And it was amazing. And then there was another time, again, the outlaws are coming over and I put it on Facebook just for a long weekend. And there was a lady called Julie Poole down um, near Plymouth. She says, well, come on down here. And I thought, well, you're sure, because you don't know me. I could be a mad axe murderer or something. But apparently she's a medium, so she'd already checked me out and said, no, get your butt down here. So I went down there for a long weekend, which I've, I've still got family in Plymouth as well. So I was able to see them and stuff. So it, 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 it's amazing when you start putting things out there like that. I mean, there was a guy I'd done um, a healing session on him at one point and I wanted to catch up with him again and he lives in the Lake District. And so I'd gone up there, well, before I got up there, I tried to contact him by phone and messenger on Facebook and stuff and he changed everything and so nothing was getting through to him. But I remember going up there and I was sitting outside this cafe in Keswick and it was rammed full of people and then all of a sudden he came bowling down the road and we met up and had the chat. But I think it was the fact that I put it out there. He'd energetically heard it because the odds of that happening were like 200 to one or something like that or thousands to one. And there we were. And then we had this major catch up. So, yeah, it was brilliant. Wow. Yeah. That is brilliant. It's all about vibration, though, isn't it? Being yes. on the same, yeah. being on the right frequency. Yeah. And that's the big thing. You don't want to think about what you don't want because you get more of it. You need to think about what you do want and how you would like it and what it would feel like as if you already had it. And when you start changing your thinking about stuff like that, you'll be amazed at what starts to happen in your life and the synchronicity to the people you'll meet that help you to get on your path and to go forward and stuff like that. It's absolutely amazing. But when you, where you're still, if you're still stuck in kind of victim mode, woe is me, or I've got no money and I've got this and I've got that, you're going to get more and more having no money and so forth. And I've had to learn this a lot because I realise that, especially more recently in the last few years, what I think about, I manifest in some way or other quite quickly. And so I've noticed positive stuff just happens, but I've got to then be equally careful that if I'm thinking negative stuff, that's going to happen just as quickly as well. And I don't want that negative stuff. I don't want to stay on the positive side. So, yeah, it's amazing how the universe works. And we don't really know, well, most humans don't know how to tap into it. There are a few. But if we did, we would be gods. We are gods, we just haven't got the knowledge at the moment, or most of us, to be able to tap into it so that we can use our gifts because we've all got them within us. They're just late, they're just sitting there because we don't know how to use them and we haven't woken them up. We've got a team of guides and guardian angels and stuff like that. And how many people say, Oi, do us a favor, Gizan, to sort this out? But they can't interfere until you tell you give them permission. So they're all sitting up there, all stiff, twiddling their thumbs and going, for Christ's sake, okay, will you give us something to do? You know? So now they're getting lots to do. They're probably saying, 
can we go on holiday? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's brilliant. Yes. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that when we start to, because it's just unlearning and then relearning, it's retraining the yes. brain to visualize what we want and yes. to, like you said, feel it. So yeah. if we take ourselves through a little movie, if we visualize, let's say, for example, we want a new car um, for whatever reason, um, I this is how I've been feeling recently is that if you start visualizing your future and visualizing what you want in your future, then little doors begin to open up. And the more you do these visualizations, these play out these little movies in your head, like you are the person, you are meeting such and such and shaking the hands and you can yeah. feel it. You have to feel it, I believe, through yes. your body as well. It's yeah. not just uh, it's not just a, an image or a couple of images. You have to no. literally close your eyes um, and kind of almost play. It's like a, a it is Imagine a future yourself image. You are driving feeling... the car down the motorway, wind yeah. in your hair, going wherever you're going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are you um, ignoring somebody, by the way? Yeah. Can you tell? <laughs> 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 he's like mom mom yeah. pay attention to me oh no bless him um but yes i think but i i also think that really that takes time um yes. to learn it and you have to be if that is a direction that you want to take yourself on then i think that you have to be patient with it and yep. you have to be consistent with it as well because um you can't sort of i mean Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but you can't send mixed messages. So Maybe if you want a goal, happens. yeah, yeah. So if you have a goal, you have to stick to that goal. Yes. And you have to keep, you know, morning, evening, daily kind of thing. Keep thinking about that that one specific goal, and gradually, it's going to take time. Nothing happens overnight. Yeah. I think that's another uh a message that's certainly put out on the internet about the law of attraction is if you think about this you do develop your vision boards and you develop um your your good visualization habits then you'll get this in the next month or get this in the next 24 hours it's not going to work like that is it, it well, no, and also in our density it's harder to manifest things but also over there in the other dimensions there's no time so when they say they're going to give you something, they don't nine times out of ten tell you when they, you're, they're going to give it to you. So you might have to put a bit of a time factor in. I would, I'm, I've got this now, but I want it to be better in three months or something like that. So you know, so they get an idea that it's not thirty years before they give you it. You know. Oh, so not only do you have to be specific with what you want, you have to be yeah. specific with when you want it. In some cases, yes. But I like to do it without setting too many details and um, criteria because you think you know what you want and what you need, but what they know you want is totally different. So rather than say, oh, I want a red Mercedes convertible and it's got to be this, that and the other, you just say, I want a new car and I want the best one for me. And then, yes, manifest it by thinking about it because you might think you want the Mercedes convertible, but the more practical car is the Volvo Estate, something like that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, but at least it's still a new car or a new house or whatever it is that you want. So yeah. I kind of just put the intent out there, let it go, and then see what the universe is going to give me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're shocked because it's not what you think it's going to be. And you go, really? <laughs> but they knew what you wanted. Mm. That's really yeah. interesting. So you kind of have to really put your faith in them, but they know what is right for you. Is that right? Yes. And yeah. I've had wobbles. I mean, I've had bits where it's gone quiet for a week and no clients have come in. And so I go, oh, got no money. And then I go, stop it. <laughs> You know, and then you start changing your thinking and then lo and behold, I get clients ringing up. 
turning up and stuff. It, it, it's just absolutely amazing. But it is hard to totally remain positive all the mm. time. At the end of the day, we are humans. Things do happen. Yeah. And when something happens, you need to go away and look at yourself and real and try to see what the, the that event was trying to teach you or what that person said, why it upset you or, you know, because there's a lesson in there for you, it triggered you. So, oh, right, the universe is saying, right, I need to go and have a look at this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so really it's not to get involved with the person or the event because that's only the messenger. So, you yeah, all right, okay, thanks for that. And, and walk off and then go, so why did they trigger me? Why did they sort that out? You know, what yeah. made me react like that? And it, it's quite eye-opening when you look at it. So for somebody yeah. just going through um, a spiritual awakening at the moment and they're starting to experience um, messages through images or voices or synchronicities, what would you say to them to help them develop on this to help okay, them grow? It's quite funny. Quite a number of years ago, I was doing a mind, body, spirit in Derby, and there was a young lad came in, and one of my medium friends spotted him first and called him over and started talking to him. He, apparently, he had his last three pound fifty, and he used it to pay to get in. Mm. But he was an alcoholic. And he was doing drugs and stuff. And so you would have thought he'd spent the last £3.50 on a can of alcohol instead. But he came in the show. She collared him and read him a bit of the riot act and then brought him down to me. And I was talking to him and I said, well, why are you drinking? Why are you doing drugs? And he was saying, I hear voices. I went, all right, okay. So what are these voices telling you? Are they telling you bad things or good things? And he said, well, they telling me to go and do this and that or go and give somebody a, a message and things. I'm like, oh, right. And so you're drinking and drugging to try and blot it out. Yeah, because I, I think I'm schizo. Have you ever thought you might be a medium? What's one of them? Well, I said, you're able. You've been given a gift to communicate to spirit so you can pass messages on to others to help them in go forward in their daily life. Really? Yes. So I gave him a healing session and I had to send him back up to my mate that she picked up on some things that she needed to give him a slap about um, to go and sort his life out. But since then, I know he's come off of drinking drugs. He's got himself a decent job, a new partner and all the rest of it. And his life has totally and utterly changed. But it was because he didn't realise he was a medium. He thought he was a nutter. So... I think the best thing to do, especially if you're waking up, and there'll be loads of people around you that say, oh, you're talking a load of rot. You know, that doesn't, that's not true, and this, that, and the other, and they'll try to disparage you and put you down. And I mean, my family, they think I'm absolutely nuts. I'm the mad uncle, or my kids, they look at me and they go, really? You know, uh, but ignore them. I try and find people... Because once you start putting it out there again, you'll start to find people that you can talk to that are having a similar um, experience that you're having, maybe slightly different or whatever. But then the more you start talking to these people and finding your tribe, and then once you do that, uh, then nothing holds you back anymore because you realise you're not a weirdo, you're not on your own. There are others out there who have similar gifts and can help you to get through it. You know, I mean, my daughter, she's totally and utterly against, well, not against, but but disbelieving what I do. And then she was saying to me she was having some issues with a monthly women's thing. And she was actually taking a, a tablet to prevent her having a heavy monthly. And she'd been on it for about two years. Anyway, I persuaded her to get on the couch one day and done a session on her. And lo and behold, the following week, she rang me up and said, you asshole, you've made me come on. And I said, yeah, good, because for two years she hadn't. And so all that hormone imbalance was building up, building up. 
and I'd overrode the tablet and made her have a period. But then everything starts to reset itself. And apparently the worst thing was if she if it had been the week after, she'd have been on holiday and unprepared. So at least it went, at least it happened before she went on holiday. So now she's got that thing in her head that maybe my dad isn't talking as much rubbish as I think he is. So she still thinks I'm weird, but <laughs> yeah, so it's there, you know. And I'm not, I know I've done that on a few others as well. I mean, one lady, she was on, been on tablets for about 10 years to stop her having a period and I overrode it and again she rang me up and called me all sorts as well but hey but it settled her hormones and she went from being this really angry person to a nice calm placid lady so that's incredible that's yes. amazing so let's touch on mental illness just for a little moment here um and when you were were speaking about uh, the young guy that you uh, that went through with the realization that he was a medium. Yeah. So there's a a bit of a misdiagnosis there, isn't there? Because he thought he, he was so he thought he was mentally ill or mentally insane, but actually he was gifted. Well, they say, and forgive my um, colloquialism, that what a shaman sees in a nut house his clients there may be one or two in there that they can't do anything with because they're too far gone for whatever reason but most of them could be sorted out but when you go into one of these institutions they're not so good at sorting you out more at dumbing you down and turning you off with medic medication and stuff like that i'm just writing that quote down here because i think that's really powerful what a yeah. what a shaman sees in a nut house. What what? Sorry, could you repeat that? What a shaman sees in a nut house is actually it's clients. just clients. Clients. It's, that's incredible. A little quote there. Can I just get you to move your mic a bit closer to your face again? That's it. Yeah, that's sorry. Good. That's I thought I could hear myself breathing. I didn't want to breathe into it and deafen you. No. So, um, if you so, yeah. if you don't hear yourself breathing through it, then you ought to get worried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just touch back on that mental illness thing. Okay. So I've be before I met you, before I kind of came into this community, I always had the th a theory that schizophrenia and manics um are being channeled that that was always my my theory all the serial killers that claim in their testimonies that they were having voices telling them to commit crimes i my theory was that they were being channeled do you think what do you think about that do you think there's some truth in that whether it's channeled or whether they have entity attachments or stuff like that that is con that they've allowed to control them um some of them as well i believe and again this is like the, the conspiracy stuff truth for stuff they may have been mk altered so a lot of these shootings that are going on in america uh, yeah. the belief mm -hmm. is that they have been mind controlled to go and do that because the aim is the American government wants to disarm the population. Because what is coming, the last thing they want is a population with full of guns that are going to shoot. So that's why I believe that a lot of these incidences in the States are happening, because that's the excuse. And like Canada's just done it, they just said, right, we're going to take all your guns off of you. Because, I mean, Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau, I believe, is getting a bit scared at the minute because it's not going the way he thinks it's going to go so yeah i mean obviously over here we um most of us haven't got guns but i still think they're getting scared which is why they're passing some of the laws that they're doing at the moment mm -hmm. you know the fact that you are now no longer allowed to go on the street and express your discontent about the government without fear of being arrested and things it's bad um, but coming back to your point 
the other thing as well that we don't realize is that there has to be duality on earth because that's the only way we can learn lessons um, and it's, this is really hard to to think about because now we're going into like soul contracts so I as you know firmly believe that we write our story when we're upstairs and we start our film and we get the t-shirt and we've agreed to all these people and events to happen and then we're born and we've forgotten about what we've agreed so then enter stage right our perpetrators our rapists or our bullies or whoever it might be it even could be parents and stuff that we've agreed we wanted to experience a bad relationship with parents so they do whatever they have been agreed to do for us and then they exit stage left and they leave us this blubbering mess in the middle so what we need to do is to and it's easier said than done is to step back and go what the bloody hell did I want to learn from this? Why did I want to get raped? Why did I, you know? And there may be some karmic stuff going on that you was a rapist in a past life, so you have to see both parts of it. It may be that there's a, a, a lady in Manchester, I know she got raped five times. Um, and now she works with women that have substance abuse and so on because they've been raped and things. Why she needed the lesson five times, I don't know. But my claim to fame is I'm the only bloke in Manchester that can hug her. Because wow. she totally distrusts, obviously, men. Um, so, but her lesson was to experience that so she can help others. Because maybe if you haven't experienced it, you don't really know what the victims are going through. And so you may not be as good at helping them. It's a bit over the top having it happen to you five times, like, but hey, I don't know the story whether it took the third or the fourth time to give her the boot up the backside to get on the path she's on now. I don't know. And it's really hard, <coughs> excuse me, to start looking at soul contracts and why things happen. And normally the person that does the biggest harm to you is a person that loves you the most in spirit because they're the only ones that have got the guts and the gumption to be able to come out down here and treat you like that knowing that they love you so much <coughs> and they're going to cause you so much pain and discomfort and so on wow that's really powerful mm. never thought about it that way no so where you may have picked a narcissistic father and a mother that um, normally the mother then would be a really em big empath because that's why narcissists and empaths get together is that the empath is the bright light and then the narcissist is one of the moths that wants to go and feed off of the bright light but they treat them the way they treat them because it's um, the narcissist's lack of security and all the rest of it that they feel they have to dumb you down and make you feel worthless and that they're the only person that will put up with you when it isn't the case when you stand in your power and stand up to the narcissist the narcissist goes away but it's hard to stand in your power especially as an empath because you want to fix people and you want to help people and all the rest of it and you think you might be able to fix them and change them and but it's they're clever and over a period of time it's that programming and they get you to make you believe their beliefs when really you need to step back if you can and believe your belief and that you do have the power and you can stand up to them and as soon as you do that they know they've lost and they disappear I'm, I'm, I say that might be easy they may fight first because they think oh you've had your front to dump them or ditch them or whatever it is and I'm perfect there's nothing wrong with me but we know different so yeah yeah it's quite um, true as... it's quite um um typical of narcissists to have been through some really awfully well trauma in their time as well yes um yeah. that they haven't come to terms with can't come to terms with refuse to come to terms with and yeah. so these negative these this awful 
negative aggression kind of just grows and grows and then yeah. that's where they grow this complete boundary of they succumb I, to the fear hmm. yeah yeah and they have to put on this this mask this face of i'm actually better than everybody else and i'm fine yes. the way i am and nothing will ever hurt me and you know you know everything's everything's perfect just the way it is i've done the mask thing i mean i got bullied as a child both in England and then we went to South Africa and I got bullied there. So when we came back, my father enrolled me in an all-boys school in Plymouth. So I thought, well, I'm going to get bullied here. So I became the school nutter. And then people wouldn't mess with me because they thought, oh, I'm not going to mess with him. He'd take me around the back and stab me or something silly. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, I wouldn't have done, but they left me alone and I never got bullied again. Yeah. Yeah. So we do do these things. It's personal ego comes kicks in and gives us some sort of protection. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So, what about death? Then, so we've talked. We've talked about before death, uh, before birth, signing our soul contract. We get to the end of our life. We've learned the hopefully we've learned the lessons that we've yeah. signed up to learn. We come to the end of our lives happily, hopefully. Um, what about the the process of death because i i'm obsessed with the process of death and death itself um have been since birth funnily enough um and from what i've learned um from the mountains of research that i've read the books that i've read um videos documentaries i've watched that just before you your body kind of gives up or your body is spent, your ancestors and your guides all come to greet you and let you know that what's going to happen, where you're going. It's not quite your time just yet. This is certainly what I've heard from, from some nurses as well, actually. Um, and then you have a bit more time to process what happened, maybe say goodbye to relatives or whatever. And then you're gone. They come and get you and, and then they, they take you up. And you do have some sort of judgment up there because I I do watch a lot of... I wouldn't um, call it judgment, though. I call it self-life review. Oh, I like that. That's it's nice. not, there's not God sitting up there on a throne and saying, oh, you naughty girl, you're going to hell. <laughs> Get down there. Or you've been a goody two-shoes. You can come in. We'll open the gates for you. So do you think that's uh, that's something that the Christians have said or oh, you're going to be judged yeah. kind of as a threat like oh my yeah, god it's, must it's all a control good. mechanism if you don't do as we do as we say then you're going to hell so you better yeah. or else yeah 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 definitely so, it's a so life anyway is... i've had it firsthand if you like I, I mentioned earlier that my mother um passed away last year well she's come back through from the mediums not just to tell me that the healing's going through the roof but she said if she'd have known what it was like over there, she'd have gone a lot sooner. So when she was here, she kept saying, oh, I've had enough. I want to go home and all the rest of it stuff. Um, but she was scared. She was brought up a Catholic, so she didn't know where she was going, if there was something. Um, and then when she did go, she was quite lucky. She got up one morning, she had a cup of tea, finished a cup of tea, and then checked out. So when I go, that's the way I want to go. So I'm not scared of dying because I know I'm going to a better place. And also all your aches and pains and everything else and all disappear. It's the manner of dying that perhaps worries most people. You don't really want a lot of suffering before you go and things like that. However, you've agreed your death. It's in your book. Mm. Yeah, you've already signed it. Yeah, you might have free will. You might change things if you can. But if it's written, there's not, you have free will, you can go and do whatever you want to do within certain parameters because you have this contract and therefore you're here to fulfill that contract. And your guides and guardian angels are going to help you fulfill that contract. I don't care. People say, oh, my guardian angels all fluffy and light. And yeah. No, they're not. If you deviate from your contract, they're going to stick their heavenly size 11s up your butt to get you back onto the contract that you've agreed to do, mm -hmm. however hard it may be. 
And if you don't and you continue to ignore them, there's normally something they'll do that will make you sit up and take notice. Or you'll just have to come back and do it again. So we might as well attempt to do it this time and get it all sorted out. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing, and I've only read this, I've not experienced it, is, um, I'm trying to remember the title of the book. I can't, but anyway, there was two ladies. One was a nun and one was your average Christian, but they were best friends. And the nun died. So she said she would come back to her friend and tell her what it was like over there. Her friend was obviously a bit of a medium. Anyway, she said when she first went over, she went into a hospital bay for a little while to, and I think that's all about adjusting your vibration to the level that you need to be so that you can exist over there after coming from this density. Um, and then she said that her level was the fifth dimension. So, but she chose to stay in the hospital bay after she had her own life review and looked back and saw where she'd gone wrong, the lesson she hadn't learned and all that sort of thing. And she's decided to stay in the hospital bay because that's what she'd done as a nun was look after people <clears throat> and help them raise their vibration. And then occasionally she would go off to the fifth dimension or whatever to learn whatever she needed to learn to raise a vibration over there. Um, and every now and again, she said they had to do a rescue job where they would go down. So you've got, like I believe, something like 12 degrees of light 12 dimensions of light and then there's 12 dimensions of darkness underneath but that darkness doesn't necessarily mean evil and all the rest of it and she said they had to do rescue jobs so every now and again they might go down into the fifth dimension of negativity if you like and she said there was an artist down there one day and he was painting in shades of black and grey and she just said to him you need a bit of white in that and he said, well, you can't get it here. She said, no, you can get it in that shop up there on the next dimension. So he moved up a layer. And then he would keep moving up a layer till he come back to the hospital bay and then they would sort him out. And then <clears throat> he would go on. And she said that at one point it was one of Hitler's henchmen had come into the hospital bay and he was still in a coma. And he might have been for the next 100, 200 years or whatever but he'd now come into the hospital bay so that they could help to raise his vibration so that in the future, he could start working his way up. Because you have to have dark and light. It's a balance all the time. If you didn't have polarities, you'd have a vacuum and nothing would move. Mm. And we wouldn't learn anything when we're here. So mm. it's negative, positive, dark, light, whatever you want to call it. You know, and so that we stop. I mean, what would be the point if we were going to come here and we wouldn't learn anything and we wouldn't do anything? And, you know, and as soon as you stop learning here, you go home. And it's one of the things that we were taught to do when I was doing my shamanic training is you journey to see your death. And so anything that happens between now and then, you know you're not going to die. And so, therefore, it helps you to overcome fearfulness of confronting things. Apparently, because I've not long got over pneumonia and pleurisy at the beginning of the year, and I've had the message that spirit were a bit worried because they thought I was joining them sooner than I should have done. However, I didn't. And so, therefore, my the death that I've seen, and I'm quite an old man, I die in my sleep, <clears throat> is still on the cards. I've not changed it yet. I've not gone on to another timeline. So, mm. oh my goodness, mm. how did you get? How did you get through all that? At the beginning of the year, then, when you were really sick. Well, I've had so two things. I had that. a heart bypass at the end of two thousand and nineteen, and then I've had the pneumonia and pleurisy at the beginning of this year. <clears throat> There's two things going on. A, I know it was a lot of emotional stuff that I hadn't dealt with. It was also abusing my body when I was in the army in, in Germany, when everything was cheap, bags, booze, blah, blah. Um, but also, there was a soul contract where there was a chain going on in my life through my ancestors. So my granddad and my dad 
and myself were all in jobs that we thought were boring and not very good and stuff like that. They were both coming up to retirement, so they couldn't really leave the job. <clears throat> and then they wanted to retire and enjoy themselves. But they were also in marriages that weren't working for them. And so, so was I. And so one of the things that I did with Jeannie Rogers, my shamanic teacher, is she helped me to journey to the Hall of Akashic Records where I met this guy that looked like Jesus, but, you know, dressed in all the biblical gear. And he had my soul contract as a piece of parchment. And he changed it and then signed it. And I signed it and I gave him a pearl while I was up there. So on the proviso that when I came back to reality, I would give a pearl down here. So eventually I went down the local river, done a bit of a ceremony on a bridge, chucked the pearl in the river. And I got back in my car to drive home. The next I'd been pushed right back in my seat by my third eye. And I went, what the? And then I, ah, right. You know, I don't get subtle messages. So you're giving me the message that I've completed my side of the contract. So I still had the heart condition. I had to go through that but it didn't kill me mm. whereas it killed my dad and my grand so that's quite a profound bit of knowledge that you can change your soul contract within reason that's incredible mm. so Mm, there's a few directions that I want to take here, actually. How much longer have you got? Have you got a little bit of time like. still? Well, let's just touch on illness a bit more then and okay. how um, certain things can manifest themselves as, as illness in different parts of the body. Yes. So, Because I remember when I came for a session with you uh, and you said I was holding negativity in certain joints around my body. Yes. Would that then if that wasn't removed, would that manifest itself as a physical illness, maybe um, inflammation or, I don't know, yes. something like that? What do the different parts of the body, what, so what kind of signs? You get ill in your aura Question. first, and depending on the layer it's in and stuff like that, and then you bring that illness into your body through your thoughts and stuff. So let's take cancer because it's quite prevalent at the moment i'm led to believe that cancer is all about a lack of self-love and disconnection to god the universe whatever you want to call it and then the various parts of the body there becomes a secondary emotion behind it so breast cancer for instance is either a lack of perceived nurturing from mum and or you don't nurture yourself so on top of the fact that you don't love yourself and you may hate yourself and all the rest of it, even if this is subconsciously, and then you're not nurturing yourself, so therefore you're creating your breast cancer. Yes, some of it is foods and things like that, but I don't think that's the main thing because there are lots of people that are terminal. They give them a couple of days to live. They're on the way out. Then they realise the lesson. And they change it. As soon as they realise the lesson, miraculously, the cancer goes away overnight. Mm. And the doctors are all going, well, how did that happen? It must be a miracle. Mm. Well, in a way, it was a miracle, but the miracle was created here. Mm. And you've overcome the lesson. And so liver is all about where you store your anger. Spleen and pancreas is all about not having enough sweetness in your life. And then you get the old wives' tales, oh, your stomach is because you can't stomach life or you haven't got the stomach to do something or um, gallbladders you haven't got the gall to go and do whatever it is you need to do so kidneys is all about fear you know um, and normally if you're really really scared you might pee yourself so that's kidney so and bladder yeah it, it's when you really start looking at all of this it's amazing but we perpetuate it because we do, once we get ill or we're stuck in fight and flight and we're building up on that fear and we get more fear and anxiety and anxiety is an imagined fear. You think something's going to happen and it doesn't, but you wind yourself up about it. And, and so you're 
becoming more and more stuck in fight and fly. So like we said earlier, it takes everything into your arms and legs to facilitate that and switches everything else off. So it then just becomes a vicious circle. But if, like I say, if you have that realisation, bang, you come out of fight and flight and then your body gets a chance to say, thank you Christ for that, and starts to reset itself. Restore factory settings, I call it. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you get well. Technically, you should get well. That's amazing. So what about um, like other other illnesses like fibromyalgia that's an interesting one well again that's where you have normally either been in one big um traumatic scenario or it's been over a long period of time like maybe you've been in a relationship with the narcissist or whatever it is and it's just built up and built up but you again you've been stuck in fight and flight so all your autoimmune system has switched off your stomach bacteria has been messed up you know, your, um, your nervous system as well has probably shut down to help you to do the fight or flight bit. So again, that is reversible. You need to take yourself out of fight and flight, change your situation. That might be easier said than done because it may mean you've got to leave your husband and then there's a fear of not being able to live on your own. And normally because your narcissist has put you down and told you you're incapable of being able to do that. Um, so you're worried about the roof over your head, food on the table, money in your pocket and stuff. But when you take that leap and when you stand in your power, you'll find that a lot of your illnesses will start to go away. Mm. And yes, you may have to change lifestyle because while you've been in that, you, you'll have been put, trying to put the sweetness back in your life by comfort eating or you may have turned to alcohol or drugs or something like that where you won't need them anymore. So you can start again, coming out of all of that and resetting your life and then going on to be the better you. Mm. But it takes that, the big lesson is to take that leap of faith and say, right, I've got to go and do this. I've got to yeah, stand out of it. It's that first step. It's just, it, it, yeah. seems, it seems like a mountain to climb for so many. Just yes. that, excuse me, that, that first step. Yep. Um, but actually, when you actually do take that first step and you look back and you think, gosh, it actually wasn't that big. It wasn't that big a deal. Um, and, and I can relate that to, to years ago when I decided to step out of my family, awful family situation yep. and take the leap to go and live and work and live the dream abroad. You know, yes. I wanted just wanted to go and work in the bars and have fun and party and not have to deal with any drama. And but when you did that, yes, you went to do that to enjoy yourself. But were you running away from the lesson? Very much so. Yeah. Mm. Very, very much so. Yes. But I know that now, but I yeah. didn't know that at the time. Um sure. but the taken the leap because it was complete independent well I mean I suppose I was completely independent anyway but I didn't realize it at the time yeah. as well I was kind of still had those cords if you like um that have now been cut but thanks to you um yeah, thank so you. <laughs> um but as soon as I got over to the other side and I started living and working and actually enjoying another side of life that I never knew even existed you know, I looked back and I thought, my God, all that anxiety, all that stress yeah. that I had, that I was so worried about, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to die. It's not like we're putting ourselves in in danger because we're not, but we think we are, but we're actually not. There's always going to be food of it wherever we are, whatever yeah. big decision we are thinking about taking and we're feeling anxious about making that decision and getting through to the other side. Um, there's still going to be food available. There's still going to be water available. Yeah. We're still going to have a roof over our head. And they're the basic fundamental things we need to survive. The rest of it is just in our heads. You yes. know, it's what we've built up, so, which is, I, it's not possible for some people to understand. I, you know, I get that. But making, if you just do something even smaller 
and then build up to that one big decision that you want to make in your life yes. and gradually you'll gain the confidence um it's all but, about realizing your self-worth and your self-love um, and when you do that then your life changes because then you have the guts if you want and the power mm. to be able to change your life but while you're in the beliefs that you are worthless and you're not lovable and etc cetera, etc cetera, mm. then you remain in the position that you've created for yourself because you have created that position mm. yeah because you're not learning the lesson and you're still there and you may be in that position and look at other people's lives and go, oh, if that was me, I'd go and change this, that, and the other. But you're doing the same thing, only you don't realise it, possibly. Yeah. So it's all about you waking up and realising your self-worth and self-love, standing in your power and then moving on. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many different ways that I think um, people can start developing their own power and stepping into their own power. And just yeah. something as small as taking a little online a, a week's online course free course or something like that just something as simple yes. as that or running a mile without yep. stopping you know these little tiny things go a week or go a day without having a drink go a day without smoking a cigarette yep. smoke the next day but you've just gone a whole 24 hours without smoking a cigarette and that's a small win yep. and the more of these small wins that you can give yourself yes, the more it's building your self-confidence exactly yes yeah exactly <clears throat> and then when it then then gradually actually you begin to see your life changing before your eyes without you know thinking without having these big realizations and that's yeah. when the fear sets in again and anxiety and you start to gradually feel it and you think oh my god i did that that yes. feels really good. I didn't know I could do that. That feels so good. And then all of a sudden, you can literally feel the tingles of positive energy running through your body. And you think, right, what can I do? What, what's next? What else can I do? And then you start stepping out of this uh, fog, out of this haze that, that you might have gotten yourself into. And you think, right, what's next? Let's go. Let's climb a, let's climb a little bit higher up the mountain. And you start pushing yourself further and further. I'm on okay. a I'm on an, an app on my on my phone. It's just a, a meme app, and I see, I'm constantly seeing people on there just reaching out for help. I'm so depressed. I'm stuck in all over the world. I'm yeah. stuck in this rut. I'm stuck. Um, I don't know what to do with myself. Uh, it's quite a male dominated meme site. So there's a lot of males on there, like young males, even going through like exams at school or college or uni yeah. or their jobs or they've just got divorced or whatever. Um, I'm feeling suicidal. I mean, there is thread upon thread upon thread. And then you'll just see this one couple of lines from uh, it's completely anonymous. Yeah. Um, there might be a flag on there to say what country these people are from. Um, just a couple of lines saying I'm suicidal or I'm feeling depressed or whatever and nobody's replied to that thread and I can't help as soon as I've read that I can't help but think oh my goodness nobody's replied to that in two hours because there's a timestamp on it what if that person's gone and bunked themselves quick I better write something so I'll always write something positive and I try and just say just do something small so don't stop yeah. just do something small to move forward it doesn't matter what you do it's quite um, funny. I um, I had a mind, body, spirit show that I went to do in Harrow in London, um, and it's quite uh, there's a, a lot of ethnic minorities around there, or ethnic people, shall I say? They're not really minorities. Um, and I had three guys that were all threatening suicide, and what came to light was they were all in arranged marriages and they've been programmed because of tradition how to treat their wives and stuff but then because they weren't being perhaps very nice to their wives or whatever the wives weren't sleeping with them which then made them feel that they weren't a man and they weren't worthy and all the rest of it they couldn't divorce their wives because if they did there would be an honour killing involved. Mm. And so I worked on three, but one in particular, 
I actually got the chance to talk to him a bit more. And he'd not long been into this arranged marriage. And I just said to him, well, I know a little bit because I used to live with a Sikh family about your tradition and stuff. And I said, I know you about your arranged marriage, but why don't you go back and have a conversation with your wife and ask her what she wants. Instead of you being, you know, the head of the family and telling her what she wants, why don't you go and ask her what she wants? Anyway, he did. And then about a year later, I was helping friends at Olympia set their stall up. And I saw him walk through one day. And I remembered his face, but I didn't remember the session or anything like that. Anyway, I said to him, oh, hello, you all right? And the next minute, he's like a limpet, a Klingon. He's giving me this huge hug and everything else. And I go, all oh, right, OK, he's with his mum as well. And he, he turned around and he says, you saved my marriage. I said, really, why? He says, well, I did go back and I did talk to my wife and I did ask her what she wanted. And now we work as a partnership instead of me being the, you know, the authoritarian telling her what she should do. So, you know, it, it, it's amazing when you look at things differently, and change your beliefs, what may happen. Expectations happen. versus yeah. desire, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so it's fantastic. That is lovely. That's a really lovely story. Yes. But, but yeah, because he would have, well, yeah, it is all the demands of those expectations and then him yes. realising, well, actually, it doesn't have to be this. Well, that kind of relates back to what we started about when he was talking about masculinity and things like that and all the old school, oh, well, the woman's changed the kitchen sink and she does all the hard work and stuff while the old man's down the pub enjoying himself and all of this. Yeah. That ain't happening anymore. That's, well, it probably is still happening, but slowly but surely it's changing. And the divine masculine is getting in contact with its divine feminine. And it's a partnership. Equally, it can't be too far the other way that, you know, women's live for the bra and blokes are all, all blokes are arseholes. Some may well be arseholes, but, you know, <laughs> those people I think have gone a little bit too far. And forgive me, this is my belief, the other way. They haven't sort of worked the balance out yet. Yeah, definitely. And I hope that, you know, those that do watch this and that do listen to what you're talking about do have the, the confidence then to yes. step into their own power and do have the confidence to think, well, there's Kev here. I've listened to everything he has to say and he's actually got a point and there's time to start making some little changes. I mean, that's yep. kind of what I aim, you know, from this video. I, I hope that people would take that from this video that would take some, um, a lot of value from this actually. Um, and also book a session with you as well because you are out and about everywhere. So how can people get in touch with you? They can go through my website, The Uncommon, heartfelt touch and um, there's all the booking facilities and that on there um, a lovely lady down in london sorted it all out for me because i'm a technophobe um so yeah you can go on there i can do it either in person or i can do it remotely through zoom and stuff like that so i am available worldwide um you can also ring i have facebook pages under my original business was connective therapies but I'm slowly shifting that over again to the Uncommon Heartfelt Touch. So you can find me under that on Facebook. You can ring me 07714-877-462. Talking is free. You know? Absolutely. And I'll put a link in there as well. So thank you. everybody can know how to get in touch with you. Thank you so much for, no, for you, being Sam, here. For you, and for, yeah, for chatting with us today. It's been absolutely brilliant as always kev as always yeah. I love it. <laughs> mm. yes. um so thank you and i'm just gonna sign off here is there anything else that you would like to say any any messages that you would like to put out there have you got another couple of weeks because <laughs> we can talk about this subject forever and ever it's absolutely amazing and i'm continuously learning 
I'm continuously trying to enhance my connection to the universe so that I can help more and more people. Um, I love what I do, as I said before, it's my calling, it's not a job, it's just brilliant. And yes, I need pain for it because I've got to live, but my biggest reward is seeing hopefully the, dis the difference I make in people's lives and the feedback I get. You know, that's just it for me. That's lovely. Mm. All right. Well, yes, let's definitely have you back anyway. Um, and we'll have a chat another time, definitely. We'll, uh, we'll put something in the diary. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sam. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.